So it's very appropriate that you asked about anticholinergic burden um, because it actually ties into our next talk. There are many anticholinergics that are used to treat bladder symptoms in Parkinson's disease. So we're ending on a clinical topic today, uh, Parkinson's disease in the bladder. Uh, and uh, we're really delighted uh, to have uh, Dr. Ann Peltier Cameron talk to us about this. She is the James Monte Legacy Professor of Urology and Associate Chair for Quality and Safety in uh, Urology here at Michigan Medicine. She has research interests in neuromodulation, neurogenic bladder, female incontinence surgery, and post prostatectomy incontinence. Um, so let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Cameron. Great, thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna say the same thing. Like, what a great tie into this next lecture because you're gonna hear the word cholinergic and anticholinergic a lot during my talk today. Uh, so, this is me. Uh, just for uh, disclosures, I have no relevant disclosures. I'm not affiliated with any of the uh, products or drugs that I'm mentioning today. I do have to disclose that I am on the American Urological Association guidelines for overactive bladder and for neurogenic bladder, which actually ties in well to this, but I'm not representing the AUA. So the urinary tract is actually pretty amazing, and I'm gonna give you a rundown of how the urinary tract and bladder work. I am pretty biased, because I think the bladder is amazing and is the most fascinating organ in the whole body, so just bear with me, please. Uh, so the kidneys produce urine, and you can see here that the kidneys are paired organs. They produce urine, and that urine is delivered to the ureters that peristalse the ureter down towards the bladder, and that's a one-directional peristalsis, unlike in the gut, where peristalsis goes in both directions. There's a flat valve entering the bladder, so the ureters enter the bladder and the urine can only go in one direction. And that's provided that the bladder stores urine at low pressure. If your bladder is storing urine at high pressure, then it's going to back up and get reflux. But the bladder does way more than that. Just think about it. The bladder all day is storing urine at low pressure without you being aware of it, keeping you continent without you thinking about it. You can jump on a trampoline, you can run to the bathroom, you can drive your car, you can read a book, you can get up from a chair, and you don't leak a drop, hopefully. And then when it's time for you to go to the bathroom and urinate your bladder, just like that, can switch to avoiding function, contract, and empty your bladder in around 20 seconds. That's actually pretty amazing. The bladder muscle, which is smooth muscle, is actually the most distensible muscle in the entire body. The bladder can distend three times its length, which doesn't sound impressive, but my biceps can only distend 30%. So 300% versus 30%. So the bladder is actually a really amazing organ. So that's why I operate on it. And basically, I'm a plumber. So I'm really, I won't get too complicated other than that. So incontinence is not a normal part of aging. Uh, normal is the wrong word to use. Incontinence happens. Incontinence is common. But it is certainly not a normal part of aging. And it is not uh, viewed as such in my profession. However, it is very, very common. Lower urinary tract dysfunction and incontinence is present in half of women and 20% of men across the population. So it is not rare, but it is certainly not normal. So here's some quick anatomy. Um, we have a female bladder on the left and male bladder on the right. And you can see there are substantial similarities. Both genders have a detrusor, which is the main muscle body of the bladder. Both have a bladder neck, which is the V-necked portion that enters the urethra. Men have a prostate um, surrounding their urethra, but you can see that there's extreme similarities in bladder, and there are similarities in bladder function, and they function almost essentially the same. The bladder itself has two functions. It stores and it empties. It's not more complicated than that. But it does spend 99.99% .99 of its time in storage, where it's storing urine at low pressure without your awareness. And when your bladder gets to a certain level of fullness, not too full, you don't want your bladder to only let you know that you need to empty your bladder 10 seconds before you need to go. You want to become aware of your bladder at around three quarters full, that's called social continence. Three quarters full, your bladder gets some awareness that you're full and urgency increases from there. That's actually pretty amazing that your bladder can do that without you actually thinking about it. And it also keeps your sphincter closed without you thinking about it. It's an automatic reaction. And again, emptying can happen in 20 seconds. So you can empty that entire bladder volume just like that. So this is what that looks like on fluoroscopy. 
So this patient is full and they're given permission to void and there is their bladder neck opening and then they void. This just happened to be one of the only normal urodynamic studies that I had. A patient who was being cleared for transplant and they were totally normal. So I'm like, wow, I'm gonna save that. <laughs> so just to explain the connection between the bladder and the brain because that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. So there's the storage function. So all day long, your bladder is sending low level, low amplitude messages via your hypogastric nerve to your pontine micturition center. It's just sending that message and it sends a message back to your bladder and to the sphincter saying, hey, sphincter, stay contracted. Hey, bladder, don't contract. Hey, sphincter, external sphincter, keep contracting. And hey, bladder, relax. This is going on all day long. It is below your level of consciousness. You are not aware of this. However, when your bladder gets to that, ooh, three-quarter full, there's a high-level, high-amplitude message that's sent to your pontine micturition center. And your pontine micturition center now makes your frontal cortex aware, ooh, you need to go. But maybe you're in a really great lecture about the bladder, and you're going to wait. And so you initiate that storage function that I just mentioned to you. So let's get to voiding. So when it's actually time for you to urinate, so you're ready to go, you're sitting on the toilet, you're standing at the urinal, your frontal cortex does send a message to the pontine micturition center, which is the CEO and the coordinator of all voiding, which sends a message to the sphincter, says, all right, it's time to relax. That's actually the only part that we have voluntary control over. We control our external sphincter, and the rest is all reflexive action because our sphincter is told to relax, our bladder is told to contract, and it's told to stop contracting and we empty. But those are all reflex arcs. The external sphincter is the only part we have control over. So the idea that I can make my bladder squeeze by thinking about it is not true. Next time you go pee, think about it. Try to make your bladder squeeze. It doesn't work. It's like trying to tell your stomach to digest. You can't make it do it, but you can trigger voiding. So there are many flavors of neurogenic bladder. Urgency incontinence, so leaking without warning, tends to be the pattern when someone has a brain lesion. Spinal cord lesions lead to retention, um, and sometimes with high pressure or low pressure. And then if you have pelvic nerve injury, those can result in variable retention and incontinence. But we're really talking about Parkinson's disease. So I just gave you an overview of the bladder as a whole. And again, there are problems with the bladder that occur with the pump, so the bladder muscle can be affected the valve, the external sphincter, or the wiring, the innervation. And sometimes it's all of the above. People don't exist in a vacuum. Someone with Parkinson's disease can have bladder dysfunction. They could have had children. They could have an enlarged prostate. They could have had bladder surgery in the past. So all these things add up. You can't just think of it in isolation. And again, if your bladder doesn't squeeze, you don't empty. If the muscle is weak because of diabetes, all those can lead to retention. And then the opposite of that is bladder spasms or detrusor overactivity. So your bladder can be irritated. So you can have what looks like overactive bladder because you have a bladder stone, or maybe you have a urinary tract infection, or maybe you have bladder cancer. These are all things that are irritants. Or it could just be overactive bladder, or your nerves are not suppressing the overactivity. And again, the sphincter is what keeps you continent. The sphincter can be weak. An example is uh, women postpartum who've had weakness of their sphincter from nerve damage, from vaginal delivery, or the sphincter can be hyperactive and not contract. And this is believed to be one of the reasons that some people with Parkinson's and variants have difficulty voiding because that sphincter relaxes slowly. And there can also be blockage. Men have enlarging prostates. It starts to enlarge in puberty and it continues to enlarge throughout life. And that could be a completely separate reason. So again, to summarize all that, the reasons you can't pee is because your bladder is weakly contracting or the outlet is obstructed or not relaxing or the coordination is gone. And you can leak because the bladder is overactive, squeezing too much, or the outlet is weak or not supported, or maybe you don't notice. Maybe you're not aware that your bladder is full. So if you are completely unaware that your bladder is full and you leak, it's not because you weren't trying to leak, it's that you were just unaware, you couldn't feel it and it could be overflow. So overflow is a separate type of incontinence where your bladder is really full and any kind of activity makes you spill over. Or maybe you just can't get there fast enough and that's called functional incontinence. You know you need to go, but it takes so long to get to the restroom and to get yourself coordinated that you leak in that time. 
So urinary incontinence in all women, not just in those with Parkinson's disease, in Southeast Michigan occurs in 27% of women. Um, it's largely undiagnosed. Most women with incontinence don't ever mention it because they think it's a normal part of aging. Um, and it's, it's actually quite sad because there are many things that can be done even if they are just small things at times. Um, in men, um, it is not as common, but it is still not rare occurring increasing frequency with age. So 31% of men, men 85 and above, all men can have incontinence, and 11% of men in their 60s. So this is not rare. This is not a unique thing. This is not an uncommon thing, yet people don't talk about it. So we've heard a lot about Parkinson's today, and I'm not going to go over that in any detail. Um, and you know the where, how it occurs and the primary symptoms, but bladder symptoms are secondary symptoms. So again, constipation, urgency. Urgency is not a normal urge to void. Everyone has an urge. You have an urge to eat. You have an urge to go to bed. You have an urge to go to the bathroom. That is a normal sensation. Urgency is a feeling that you need to empty your bladder and you can't wait. So urgency is not normal, urge is normal. And also erectile dysfunction goes along with this. And Parkinson's presentation with the bladder is a little bit different than a similar but um, uh, related condition called multi-system atrophy. And those are patients who tend to present with bladder and bowel symptoms first. So that's a little bit different than Parkinson's and that can be a hint that maybe it's not Parkinson's disease and it could be something else. It's much more severe and those patients tend to be in retention. So overactive bladder symptoms, which are urgency, frequency, nocturia, which is getting up at night to urinate, and urgency incontinence, they tend to correlate with the, the movement symptoms with Parkinson's and the motor symptoms, but it's not age, so you don't necessarily have worse bladder symptoms because of your age or how long you've had Parkinson's or your tremor, it tends to go more closely with your akinetic and motor symptoms. And again, it's not an effect of aging. There is no normal incontinence with aging. Again, a large percentage of patients with Parkinson's, not all, but a large percentage do have urinary symptoms. Between 40 and 70%, urgency and frequency are incredibly common, but nocturia, so getting up at night, is probably the most common symptom and probably the most annoying because sleep is amazing. Sleeping all night is fantastic, and if you don't sleep all night, it can affect your entire day. Getting up once, we don't consider nocturia. We're talking about getting up more than once per night, which is shown to be much more disruptive sleep. Getting up once doesn't tend to affect um, your sleep that much. Um, urgency incontinence affects around a quarter of men and around a quarter of women with Parkinson's disease. And it's very rare to have retention or a weak bladder problem. Um, the medications used to treat Parkinson's, levodopa, carbidopa, can actually make the bladder worse or can make it better. It tends to be variable, and some patients notice when they first start these medications, their bladder symptoms can worsen, but people tend to go back to their baseline. So we don't discourage people from taking those medications because of bladder exacerbations, because it tends to settle down. So there are many impacts of lower urinary tract symptoms. So if you're rushing to go to the bathroom, particularly in the middle of the night, when it's dark, you're at very high risk of falls. And as we know, falling is definitely not what you want. Um, it can lead to a higher burden of care, meaning you may need more care, you may need more help, you may need more help with laundry and clothing and bathing, and that's uh, certainly not what we want. There's worse quality of life. Clearly, if you're having to bathroom scan everywhere you go, if you're having to empty your bladder every half hour, you can't even make it somewhere on the road because you're having to stop to use the bathroom, that will impact your quality of life. And again, socialization can be affected, um, as well as there's a higher risk of having to be a, a put into assisted living because bladder problems can be really hard to manage for someone as well as their caregivers. But we can't blame it all on Parkinson's in the brain. There are many more things that impact the bladder um, other than other neurological things. So men have a prostate. A prostate and its obstruction can result in urgency, frequency, and nocturia. Sometimes your activities and your behaviors and the things you do can affect your bladder. Sometimes just the way you think about your bladder, your habits, the way that you have lived your life and your bathroom habits throughout your life can impact your bladder, as well as other medications that you're taking. So you can't look at it in isolation. You have to look at the person as a whole. But we certainly know that people with Parkinson's who have 
underlying bladder or prostate problems and problems with movement, you can end up in big trouble with urinary incontinence. So what happens when you do eventually see a healthcare provider or a urologist regarding your bladder? What you should expect is to get a history and physical exam. We use urinalysis, which is um, a look at the urine to see what's in there, particularly infection. We often do an ultrasound and residual. We can do voiding diaries. Sometimes we do urodynamics, a cystoscopy. These are all tools that are available to us, but we don't need to use everything to figure out what is going on. What everyone should expect if they do get evaluated for their bladder problems is you should have someone ask you questions about your bladder and bowels. The bowels and the bladder are very intermingled in these situations, so you should really have someone assess all of that, as well as other surgeries you have. You should have a urine sample collected. You have to rule out infection. You have to rule out bladder cancer by checking for hematuria, so that's a pretty routine thing that we do. A physical exam, including a pelvic exam and prostate exam, can show other underlying problems that are unrelated to Parkinson's. And a post-void residual is a simple scan, you see that's a bladder scanner there, that says how much is left behind when you're urinating. And that's standard of care because if someone is emptying their bladder well, that's a very different problem than someone who's not emptying. So just to sh show you what kinds of incontinence exist, not specific to Parkinson's, but to give you a little urology 411, um, stress incontinence is, has nothing to do with your stress level. It has to do with the pressure put on the top of the bladder. Stress incontinence is involuntary leakage that occurs with stress or pressure put on the top of the bladder. I leak when I cough, I leak when I sneeze, I leak when I run, I leak when I jump. That's stress incontinence. Uh, that tends to be a little bit more predictable, and people aren't as bothered by stress incontinence because they can cope. They can say, well, I might wear a pad when I go for a walk because I have stress incontinence, but if I'm not going for a walk or not exerting myself, I'm not going to leak. Predictability is easy to get along with. Unpredictable things are much more difficult to deal with. And now we're talking urgency incontinence. This is um, involuntary urine loss associated with urgency. So it occurs on your way to the bathroom. It may occur randomly. You may have gone to the bathroom two minutes ago and then you have an urge and leak again. So it's not really predictable. It can be much more impactful on your quality of life because it can occur anytime, any place. It can occur in bed at night. And it's not really easy to plan around urgency incontinence other than just going to the bathroom all the time, which people with urgency incontinence do because they're trying so hard to keep their bladder empty. And that can be very disruptive because you're just bathroom scanning all the time. Other rare causes of incontinence are continuous incontinence, and this occurs from a fistula or other um, rare conditions. So that's not very common um, and is certainly not related to Parkinson's. Functional incontinence occurs when either you're unaware that your bladder is full or you're aware but simply can't make it to the bathroom. We see it a lot in the hospital when someone is hooked up to IVs and tubing and they aren't able to get out of bed or they've injured themselves or are post-op and can't make it to the bathroom on time. But also that applies to Parkinson's. If you have a lot of slowness and a lot of difficulty making it to the bathroom, it might affect you as well. Functional incontinence is one that is treated with prevention. So prevention and treatment are the same. And this involves fluid management and time voiding. So if you can plan around your bathroom habits, if you can drink about the same amount of fluid every day at the same time and plan your bathroom visits around that, you can actually substantially decrease that. So if you can work around it, it can be very effective. Overflow incontinence I mentioned earlier is when your bladder is so full that anything you do makes it leak. This is actually pretty rare and it's a form of retention, but again, that's why we check a residual urine because if someone's bladder is full, of course it's gonna leak. Urodynamics, I kind of alluded to them. They involve pressure measurement in the bladder. We measure bladder sensation, bladder pressure. We can assess whether the person is leaking from stress or from bladder contractility, and we use various sensors to do that. And this is what a urodynamic tracing looks like. It looks a lot like an EKG, but this person in this study is having a bladder spasm that I um, surrounded in red, and they leak at that time, so that's detrusor overactivity. And these are the images that you get during a urodynamic study. So let's talk about treatment of incontinence. Uh, there is prevention of incontinence, uh, which is a little bit difficult to tease out because the only advice that anyone can give 
at this point in time, although there is a large network called the PLUS network that's looking at this, is uh, have small babies. That's the only advice they can give. And that would be nice if we could plan that. <laughs> and they want you to have babies younger in life. Well, that really stinks for those of us who you know, got post-secondary education. But um, that's the only advice they can give you right now. Um, doing Kegels while you're pregnant can help prevent um, urinary incontinence, but there's not much else that we can offer people in prevention of incontinence in the future. So conservative treatments are a mainstay in treatment of any person with incontinence because no matter what I do, if you're drinking seven gallons of fluid a day, your bladder's gonna be pretty upset about that. So conservative treatments and managing your fluid intake and behaviors and physical therapy are mainstays in treatment. There's medical treatment, which I'll cover, and surgical treatment as well. So conservative treatment include things like time voiding. And it sounds dumb, like really just going to the bathroom on a schedule, is that really gonna work? I don't really feel like I need to go. But many people who have urgency incontinence have lost many of those signals. They've lost the I'm a quarter full, I'm a half full, I'm three quarters full, I'm nine tenths full, and they get the I'm 99% full, you're gonna leak in 10 seconds message. They've lost all of those messages. So the bladder, you have to outsmart it and go before you need to go. And how do you know? Well, you keep track. You write down how much you drink. You write down how often you go. And then you can time it so that you're going when you're three quarters full and not when your bladder is just about to burst and you're leaking. Uh, bladder retraining um, is somewhat similar. And that um, involves when you're home, so you don't do bladder retraining when you're out and about, but you try to give your bladder an extra five minutes. If you need to go and you're in a safe space, you can focus actively on trying to hold it for an extra five minutes and maybe get your bladder to hold a little bit more. And you can do this um, on a schedule every day. Pelvic floor physical therapy is when you see a physical therapist who will work with you on contracting your pelvic floor muscles. They'll also work with fluid intake. They'll work with um, other things. But it's, um, it can be very effective to see a physical therapist. But not everybody has the means or the transportation and maybe doesn't want to do this with someone else. So there are a few things that I can go through with you all today, and you're all going to do it while we're here today. One is called the NAC maneuver. The NAC maneuver is specific for stress incontinence, and it's just before you do an activity where you know you're going to generate an intra-abdominal pressure contraction. So you know you're going to sneeze. You know you're going to cough. You know you're going to pick up something heavy. And that involves doing your Kegel maneuver just before you do it. So I'm going to pick this up, suck it up, and then lift. And, and it really works. It can cut down stress incontinence by 50% in women who are taught to do it correctly. So doing Kegels at stoplights actually doesn't do anything because you're not actually using them at the right time. So it's Kegel, then sneeze, Kegel, then cough, and extremely effective. Urge suppression techniques I'm going to go over in a second are another way that you can control urge with your mind. So urges come in waves. The urge grows, peaks, and subsides. And if you can control your pelvic floor, during that urge peak and subside, you might not leak. And the only way that you can do that is by doing what's called the freeze and squeeze. So if your first instinct when you have an urge is to run to the bathroom, then you can't freeze, you can't squeeze, you can't control your pelvic floor muscles. All you're focusing on is your feet. So that's why we try to teach people to freeze and squeeze. So you freeze, focus on your pelvic floor, hold the urine in, don't move until the urge, because the urge will pass. Bladder contractions are a wave. They will pass, and then you can make it to the bathroom a little bit more gracefully. Um, there's a great handout for the SUFU Foundation, sufu.com, uh, and they give you some advice on how to sit through that wave, either sitting or standing, where you can sit and be still and ride that wave without leaking. So how do you do a Kegel? There's lots of different instructions that people are given. The wrong instruction is try to stop and start your urine when you're voiding because that's a bad habit. You should just urinate and let it go. But it is the same muscles that are used. So this is specifically to the women in the room. The way that you do a Kegel is you pretend that there is a marble and your labia is picking it up. Do it with me now. Pick up a marble. So you should feel your pelvic floor elevate you should feel your anus elevate, and you should not have moved your legs or your gluteal muscles. So try it one more time without moving your legs, not squeezing your butt cheeks together, and it does not involve the flamingo. Everyone knows the flamingo. It doesn't involve that, okay? Um, so the knack is exactly the same thing as a Kegel. You do it just before you lift, cough, or sneeze, and you can do it three 
quick Kegels to suppress an urge, or you can hold. See what works best for you. So this is the most effective instruction we can give people. It's nice to practice it to do um, 10 Kegels three times a day and try to hold them for as long as you can. You don't have to do 1,000 repetitions. 10 Kegels, that's, the, that's where the stoplights come in. You can practice at stoplights. But other than that, just doing it at stoplights is not effective. You have to use it at the right time. Let's not forget the men in the room. You're a turtle, and you're pulling your head into your shell. So this is in reference to the penis. You're trying to pull the penis into the body like a turtle pulling its head into the shell. Ladies, pick up a marble. Men, pull your head into the shell. Everyone's doing it, right? Right? Yes? Yes? OK, good. So there are other things you can do to help your bladder uh, be less irritable. Um, none of these are meant to invoke blame. Alcohol and coffee did not cause bladder problems. They exacerbate the problems you already have. And this is a departure from previous philosophy where patients would be blamed for their bladder dysfunction. Oh, it's because you drink too much coffee. It's because you do this and do that. No. You have a bladder condition that can be aggravated by behaviors. It's not the other way around. Drinking alcohol, drinking coffee does not ruin your bladder, does not hurt your bladder, but it will make your symptoms that day worse. So alcohol um, actually has some pretty consistent results that people who consume a moderate amount of alcohol actually have less lower urinary tract symptoms, particularly men. Um, it's inconsistent for overactive bladder, but it seems to impair prostate growth just a little bit. We're talking about moderate alcohol consumption. So for women, that's one drink a day, men, that's two. Now, excess alcohol, so very heavy drinking um, in the realm of alcoholism, um, is associated with worse bladder function, probably because of some neuropathy. But, um, and again, the advice centered in this is if you are not drinking alcohol, I am not suggesting that you take up alcohol. But if you happen to be drinking a glass of wine on Friday nights, don't feel bad. Um, caffeine, um, there are, this was, a uh, a study that I did with LEARN, but we looked at all of the literature. There were 19 articles on caffeine in the bladder, and there's actually no consistent results, which is really surprising because most people notice that their bladder is worse. However, in some work that I've done with the LEARN network, people who have overactive bladder actually avoid caffeine just on their own. Those are the people that just don't drink coffee, they just don't like it, or they've just never gotten a taste for it. It's probably because they get such significant urgency it aggravates their bladder. We see it quite consistently that people just don't drink coffee who have overactive bladder. Um, there's very little evidence to support eating one thing over the other impacts the bladder. So, you know, healthy diet is great, but don't worry about eating this or that for your bladder. Um, zinc supplementation specifically has been shown to be associated with worse bladder functioning. So if you're taking zinc, maybe reconsider that. Stimulants are not that great for your bladder. Caffeine supplements, monster drinks, please don't drink monster drinks, um, are not so great for your bladder. Um, very, very spicy and acidic foods affect some people, not all people. I tell people to do a food challenge. Don't drink any or eat anything spicy or acidic for a few days and then challenge yourself. If your bladder's fine, then you're not sensitive. Don't worry about it. Don't go on a big bladder diet because most people are sensitive to a few things and they can learn to recognize them. Diuretics, uh, such as Lasix and other medications used for blood pressure control, can often stimulate the bladder. And again, I wouldn't say stop your diuretics, but maybe talk to the person managing your blood pressure and see if they can give you something different that's a little bit easier on your bladder. And sugar, in and of itself, is not a bladder stimulant, unless you are a poorly controlled diabetic, because having a bladder full of sugar is very irritating. What we do know is that many, most, and all of us are actually drinking way, way too much water. And I say water, I mean fluids. Um, people have this idea that you need to drink, 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 stay hydrated, stay hydrated, stay hydrated. I have two little kids who tell me all the time, mom, you need to drink more water, you're dehydrated. I am not dehydrated, and you do not need to carry around a one liter water bottle with you at all times. Uh, this message is actually messaging from the Coke and Pepsi company. There is no medical science on how much fluid you need to drink in a day. There is absolutely no benefit in overhydrating. Now, certainly being dehydrated is not good for you, but being overhydrated actually has no health benefits. Some friends of mine from UCLA actually did this study. They looked at all the evidence on fluid intake because people really think that being overhydrated and drink, drink, drinking is helpful, but there was no benefit in cardiovascular disease, constipation, blood clots, headaches, cognitive function, bladder cancer, you name it, nothing is better when you overhydrate. 
Dehydration can exacerbate constipation. So if you're not drinking anything, then constipation can be made worse, and you can get a headache from being dehydrated, not just normal hydration. And there's no benefits to the eight times eight per day, except if you have kidney stones. So the only people that benefit from overhydration are those with documented kidney stones. So unless you have kidney stones, you don't need to push fluids all day long. You're not doing anything. And it also does not help with weight loss. So that's a misconception. Weight Watchers started that one. Drink, drink, drink. Um, you can do other things to distract yourself other than drinking water. All right, so let's talk about second line therapy. So we've talked about conservative stuff, which is our base, our second line, our first line therapy. And second line therapy is typically medication. So there are lots and lots of medications, as was alluded to earlier, that can affect the bladder. Most of these are anticholinergic. So we were talking about how acetylcholine, super good for your brain, super good for memory, and I'm talking about anticholinergics. Um, these are blockers of that molecule. And then there are beta-3 agonists. Um, anticholinergics or anti-muscarinics can cause dry eyes. They can cause slow transit time in the gut, which is constipation. They can cause urinary retention. Their number one side effect is dry mouth, which can be quite profound, and memory problems. So large scale studies have been done on anticholinergic burden. So that's adding up all of the medicines that you take that are anticholinergics. And they've looked at large, large population studies. And these studies take a long time because dementia and cognitive dysfunction doesn't happen overnight. You can't look at a group of people for three months and decide whether these medications are impactful. So this study looked at 60,000 older adults with dementia, and they looked at another group of patients without dementia and looked backwards at how much anticholinergic burden they had. And there was a significant rate of increase of dementia in those patients with more anticholinergic burden. So again, it's not proving that the anticholinergic caused dementia. However, if you give a person a whole bunch of anticholinergic, you give them a whole quadruple dose of, of ditropan, they are going to get confused. So any medication that taken at a higher dose than recommended makes you confused is probably not good for your brain. So it makes sense. This is not a far out there kind of correlation. Um, I've personally seen patients who've been on even a regular dose of some of these medications, and their family notices as soon as they start the medication, they have a cognitive decline, and when they go off of it, they get better. So this is not just you know, people thinking this might happen, it's been observed. So antimuscarinics come in many flavors. The oldest version is called oxybutynin or ditropan. There's an immediate release format uh, that's taken uh, two to three times per day or there's an extended release version. It is the oldest drug. It is very commonly used because it's cheap as dirt, and every insurance um, pays for this. Um, it's been proven to be safe in children and in pregnancy, which is why I don't think we should get rid of this medication. It's uh, one of the only medications that pregnant women can take safely. But it is by far the worst for brain effects. It penetrates the blood-brain barrier. It is the one that has been linked most commonly to cognitive decline when people take it. Uh, however, it is your insurance's first choice in many cases, and if someone offers you some oxybutynin, tell them you'd like something else. Um, Detrol, uh, tolteridine is the next generation medication that exists. It's, to, it's in an extended release in an immediate release format. The extended release formats are much better for your brain, by the way. Um, it is more selective for the bladder. It has less dry mouth, less crosses the blood-brain barrier. I didn't say none less crosses the blood-brain barrier. It has been tested in the elderly compared to the worst drug and performs better. It's still not awesome. Um, there's Enablex, Darifenison, Solifenison. Again, both of these came out around the same time, more specific for the receptors in the bladder. Some are more constipating, some are less constipating, but these are still anticholinergics. We're getting better as we've refined these medications, but there are still some cognitive impact. Um, Trospium or Sanctura, um, is a bigger molecule, so theoretically it should not cross the blood-brain barrier in theory, uh, and they've done um, spinal taps on people taking the medicine to see how much of it is in their uh, spinal fluid. It has less dry mouth. It's, it's probably my medication of choice if someone has to take this class of medication and has any kind of neurological condition. Um, Tobias or Proferi is a variant of Detrol. Um, so newer therapy, which is what I'm going to dwell on because I am 
much more enthusiastic about these therapies. Uh, there is Mirbetric or Mirbegron or Gemteza Vibegron. These are beta-3 agonists. These are receptors that are not present in the brain. There are no beta-3 receptors in your brain, so uh, there would be no impact even if they were to cross the blood-brain barrier. They are not an anticholinergic at all. There are no receptors in your brain. They have absolutely none of the same side effects. So all of the side effects I just told you about, these cause none of those. They can cause a very, very mild rise in heart rate, one beat per minute. They can cause a very, very mild rise in blood pressure, one millimeter of mercury, except in those people who have completely uncontrolled blood pressure. So my threshold for prescribing some of these medications is if your blood pressure is less than 180 on 100, you're good to go. So it's you have to have, you have to have really uncontrolled blood pressure for me not to be okay with that. There's occasional drug interactions, some of the more uh, advanced antiarrhythmia drugs uh, in cardiology um, interact with these medications, but again, that's what uh, prescription drug checkers are for. This is, to me, the most obvious choice in Parkinson's and other uh, neurological conditions, and it's certainly my favorite because patients will take this medication and they're like, well, I didn't get any side effects, but it actually worked. So I'm, I'm, this is my go-to. These are not available in generic, can be more expensive, but increasingly, thank goodness, insurance companies are recognizing the value in providing medications that work and also don't cause 10 new side effects that you need to take new medications. Because if you're getting constipation and dry mouth and you're taking biotin and colase and then you're taking this medication and then you're seeing your gastroenterologist because you're having bowel symptoms, we're not really saving insurance company any money, whereas these medications don't impact other body symptom systems and are as effective as the other medications without causing a whole slew of side effects. And on a side note, I had a colleague of mine give a very similar lecture to this, and he put himself on each of these medications for two weeks just to see what happened, and he couldn't work out. He's a, very, he's a marathoner, and he couldn't work out on the anticholinergics. He said he just felt so dry and he just felt so not himself. He felt so poorly that he could only train at a lower level and actually just skip the gym, which is not his style. So, and on things like Mirabegron and Bibegron, he, he said he felt like his regular self. So uh, again, this is an N of one, but you know, this is, this is really impactful. So these medications can maybe cause more trouble than they're worth. But it's not all about medications. You know, it's not just try this medication, try that medication, try this. You don't go in a big circle. You have to have an exit strategy. I call it swirling the drug drain. You certainly don't want to do that, and that is a common practice, unfortunately, to just try this one, try that one, try this one. The medications are all different flavors of the same thing. If you've tried one anticholinergic, you've tried them all. If you've tried mirror background, it's the same as trying by background. You don't need to cycle through all of them. That's a waste of time and a waste of money when there are potentially better therapies available. So there are third-line therapies. So if second-line medications don't work, there are third-line available. So um, I'm going to talk about botulinum toxin injections to the bladder, sacral neuromodulation, which is implantable electrical stimulation devices, and then there is electrical stimulation that can be delivered through percutaneous needles. But again, this involves a lot of decision making. So there are lots of different ways to make decisions with your patients. You know, there's the old-fashioned way, which was paternalistic, where your doctor just told you what to do. And then there was this informed decision making where you just give your patient a whole bunch of information. But shared decision making is a lot more complex because every person is different. And I can't tell you that this is better than that, is bigger than this in terms of these third line therapies. Everyone is different, they're all very different. So you present the information to your patient and then factor in their lifestyle, where they live, what they're interested in doing, how much their bladder is bothering them, and factor that all in together to come to a decision together. So it's kind of a circular um, uh, structure where we give information, you feed back your concerns and desires, and then we keep going until we can come to um, a decision. So sacral neuromodulation is a two-step procedure where I find your sacral foramina, that's the, the crosshairs there, is this S3 foramina that you can see on x-ray. Um, and again, um, this treatment is good for both people who have difficulty emptying and those who have overactivity. So if someone has a little difficulty emptying, this works as well. It also can impact bowel function in a really positive way because the lower bowel is innervated by the S3 nerve root. So stimulating this at a low amplitude can improve fecal incontinence, constipation, urgency frequency, urgency incontinence, and incomplete bladder emptying. 
And this is the lateral view where we put um, needles in the foramina. This is all done under sedation, so the patient doesn't require general anesthetic. And this is what it looks like in real life. Sorry about the butt. Um, and then this is what the lead looks like when it's finally implanted. Um, we put the lead in and we test it for a period of time because we don't want to implant someone with a device they don't need. So we put the wire in, test it for a period of time, and if someone gets the positive response, we implant them with uh, that thing that looks like a pacemaker because it's made by companies that make pacemakers, so it's very similar technology. There's also a micro version as well as the larger device. The larger device, the battery lasts between 10 and 15 years. The small device um, lasts two weeks, but it can be recharged externally and it lasts 25 years. So um, some people have a very skinny rear end and don't want a bigger device, and you have to be pretty skinny to feel this because the larger device is about the size of an Oreo cookie wafer, just the wafer. So you break it in two and that's how big it is. So it's not that big. We bury it approximately uh, an inch deep. So in non-Parkinson's patients, there's 80% success. So you put the wire in someone with overactivity and you see how they do. 80% of people really get a great response and go on to have the device implanted. And over the long term, people tend to do quite well because we can change the programs. So people can develop something called neural tolerance, meaning the same stimulation long term, they stop responding to it. And we can uh, tweak it and reprogram it. But um, again, the battery lasts between 10 and 15 years. There are thousands of programs we can use. So this can be really effective therapy. The device is MRI compatible. That's a new um, progress in the device, which is much more appealing for more people because you can have a full body MRI you just turn the device off. There's a, you have a phone that connects to it and you put it on. I'm having an MRI setting. Um, in specifically in patients with Parkinson's, uh, again, very small numbers. These are retrospective studies. No one has done good science on this, but 28 of 34 patients who were tested decided to have the implant, which is pretty close to the 80% in uh, people who don't have Parkinson's. And all of the patients did well long-term and most stopped their medication. In my personal experience, having implanted many patients with Parkinson's, I've had some do extremely well, uh, do extremely well long-term, and I've had others who've had uh, the device become less effective quickly over time. And I haven't figured out who is which, and again, um, I just explain that to people when we're deciding to proceed with this therapy. We don't really know who's gonna do really well long-term, but we know most people do really well, at least for the next few years. So percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation involves the needle, the acupuncture needle. Again, this woman looks very relaxed having her tibial nerve stimulation. We don't have nice chairs like that in my clinic, but, um, but that's the device you can see there. Um, again, uh, patients have therapy for 30 minutes a day, once a week for 12 weeks, and then when they get boosted up to maintenance, they go once a month. Um, they have looked at specifically this therapy in people with Parkinson's. It looked at 47 patients. And again, when they studied them urodynamically, they had a slightly bigger bladder size at fullness. So that's good. You do want a bladder to hold more. They had less voids every day, so they didn't go as often. They had less urge episodes and they had less nocturia. So all in the right direction. And at two months, so they didn't want to there's a strong placebo effect when you have people write down how often they go to the bathroom because people tend to pay more attention, but they looked at people months later and the effect was pretty well sustained in the people who continued. So again, this can be pretty attractive therapy, extremely low risk because you show up to the office, we put an acupuncture needle in, we connect it to the device and it provides the stimulation. The stimulation feels like, um, the same feeling as if you fall asleep on your arm and your hand kind of falls asleep. You get that feeling in the bottom of your foot. I'd know because I let so many people practice on me putting needles in. Um, it's not a big deal. It's not painful at all. Um, and we don't make it painful during the stimulation period. Um, and again, this is the tibial nerve right here. And you'd think, how on earth does the tibial nerve affect the bladder? But the tibial nerve connects to the S3 nerve root, the same nerve that we would stimulate with sacral nerve modulation. And so this is what's going on in clinic. It's two finger breaths behind the medial malleolus. We make a little mark and then we put the uh, needle in at that angle and twizzle it in until we can get that sensation. Um, there is new technology. This is just emerging in the last um, several months. Uh, this is called an e-coin. Uh, it's a device, you can see it next to a nickel, that can be implanted in exactly the same location and deliver the same stimulation, but at home. So you'd wear 
an external stimulator in that area, or this one is actually um, self-propelling. So this is evolving. There are six different companies developing technology for implantation of the tibial nerve. Um, and so that's what it looks like for a half hour. Transcutaneous stimulation, so this is like a TENS unit. So you'd think, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could just like buzz the skin on the outside and make a difference? There are huge studies ongoing, um, uh, a big study with 242 patients with Parkinson's, and they saw a very small decrease in urinary symptoms. And that tends to be similar to what we've seen in other bladder conditions. It seems like stimulating the skin overlying the nerve is just not enough. Um, you have to have direct stimulation to the nerve for it to be effective. I might be wrong, and someone might come out with better studies, but for now, um, the transcutaneous stimulation, which is just available over the counter, it's a TENS unit, maybe not effective, but it wouldn't hurt to try. Botulinum toxin injections are uh, something I do very frequently. I do two full botulinum toxin injection clinics a month because I have so many patients getting this therapy. You inject 100 units. Uh, it comes in 100 unit vials. 100 units is the low dose in the bladder because we want to maintain voiding. You don't want to inject too much and have someone not be able to pee. You want to start with the low dose. Um, and this was studied in people with Parkinson's. 19 out of 24 people with Parkinson's noted an improvement, and 29% said that their symptoms were almost completely resolved. Some people had to catheterize. This is the wah wah. No one really wants to catheterize their bladder, but it doesn't last that long. You may only have to catheterize for a week or two. Everyone empties not quite as well after they get botulinum toxin, but it might not bother you. Having a small residual, 100 milliliters, 50 milliliters, no big whoop. It's not a big deal. You don't have to empty perfectly. Nobody's perfect. Uh, the urinary tract infection risk um, is there. Five to 10% of people get a UTI after getting one of these injections. And in those people who already are not emptying their bladder, they are at the highest risk of having problems, which is why everyone should get a residual check before they decide to undertake this kind of therapy. And I'm gonna see if this will show. Let's see. This is real time me injecting a bladder with some botulinum toxin. So a cystoscope is used uh, to enter the bladder. I have a quick look around. Uh, the bladder is very, very thin skin, so it's translucent, so you can see all the blood vessels in the bladder. The bladder is incredibly vascular because, as I said, it can stretch from teeny weeny to super huge, and those blood vessels have to stretch with it. A lot of spiral vessels in the bladder. And so uh, this is magnified 30 times. This is a four millimeter needle, so it's not that big. But again, um, 10 locations are chosen, just separate from the blood vessels on the posterior wall. And um, it takes approximately 90 seconds to get a full Botox injection done um, in the office. Um, here I'm using a rigid scope because it gives me a better camera, like I, the camera's cooler that attaches to it compared to the flexible scope. The flexible scope is more comfortable and that's what I use almost all the time. But you can see that while I've been speaking here, and this was done with cinematographic, like, like wonderfulness. I tried to do it really like cool so that I could show this um, a Botox. I usually do it much, much faster than this, but this was me trying to be cool. Um, there are other things that people think might be helping the bladder. Deep brain stimulation has been studied in bladder um, function. Um, again, patients who've gotten deep brain stimulators, some of them had their bladder symptoms improve, um, some of their surveys improved, but it wasn't very impressive. So nothing worsened in people who've got deep brain stimulation, but it's not really a treatment for um, urinary symptoms. Uh, so we don't expect bladder symptoms to get better. They could, but they're certainly not going to worsen. So there is such thing as what we call intractable incontinence. You've tried everything, or maybe these third-line therapies are just not your cup of tea. Maybe you don't want to come to my clinic and have me put a scope in your urethra and inject your bladder. Maybe that's just not what you want to do. Um, there are better ways of managing incontinence. Proper diapering, so using proper absorbent products that will get the urine away from your skin. It's very, very important in adults. Adult urine is not like baby urine. Baby urine is not acidic. It doesn't have the enzymes in it, whereas adult urine is very acidic and will burn skin. Uh, and it needs to be away from the skin at all times. Uh, people who are diapering and padding and are continuously wet do need to use barrier creams to keep the urine away from the skin. Calmoceptin, my numero uno, um, is a fantastic product that um, soothes. It has a, a soothing sensation, but also is the best urinary barrier cream. 
and there's been a randomized controlled trial on urinary dermatitis, that is the redness and irritation that occurs with urine contacting the skin. And um, a group of nurses did this great study where they used calmoceptin or they used baby products on people's bottoms for a month and photographed all their bottoms and had a whole bunch of nurses say whose skin got the best and the calmoceptin hands down was by far better. It also um, feels better going on. Sometimes these products, when you put them on irritated and raw skin, they actually hurt and that doesn't really make you want to use them, whereas the calmoceptin actually feels better the second you put it on. It's non-medicated so you can use it as often as you want every time you go to the bathroom, every time you change your products. Uh, there are also catheters available if the um, incontinence becomes too much and if there's an element of urinary retention. But catheters can cause urinary um, infections, they can cause urethral erosion, and they're pretty uncomfortable. So there are other options out there. Uh, this is called the Purewick catheter. Uh, this is specific for women. It is used at night or if you're bed bound. Um, I'm just gonna say it like it is. This is the little hot dog that goes in the hot dog bun and there's a vacuum suction. So when you leak any urine or urinate, it gets sucked away. So you don't need to wear a pad. You don't need to have any diapering or bed padding. This sucks away all the urine and is not painful, uncomfortable. And women can get this at home. Uh, many health insurance covers cover this because if you're not getting skin breakdown and you're not needing to see plastic surgery to deal with your skin breakdown, this is actually better for their pocketbooks too. So this is used extensively in the hospital uh, to keep skin dry because dry skin is healthy skin. Men also have options, actually have more options than women do because the penis is a very convenient adhesive location and uh, you can use a condom catheter which is a sticky catheter on the penis that will collect the urine um, in a condom catheter. There are many sizes, shapes, there are stick-ons, there are uh, various ways of getting fitted. I would advise people to get fitted properly by a nurse trained in this because once you get fitted with the right catheter, it will actually stay on. And it can stay on for a day or two. You take it off to have a shower, uh, care for the skin, and put it back on. And it can offer a lot of freedom because you're not leaking and you're not wearing a stinky old diaper. Uh, super pubic tube is probably better tolerated than a urethral catheter if you absolutely need it. This is a tube that goes through the skin into the bladder. The skin in that location of the body is not very sensitive. This is not annoying to have there. It's actually relatively comfortable. The tube goes in a part of the bladder that's not as overactive, so you're not getting as many bladder spasms as with a catheter that's going in through the urethra, which irritates the penis, irritates the vulva, the vagina, and the balloon sits at the bladder neck, which is really, really annoying because it causes constant urgency. Also, um, these tubes are easier to care for, so if someone's helping you, they could help wash this area, and it's not like super weird to have um, someone who's maybe not your intimate partner help you with that because this is just your stomach and not your genitalia. Also, catheters in the urethra in men and women can erode the urethra over time, and that's a mess, and no one wants that. So this is by far recommended if you need to manage your bladder with a catheter. And a suprapubic tube can be done in uh, interventional radiology under ultrasound guidance. I do it in the operating room with this instrument called a Lousley. So um, it's uh, passed into the bladder. I make a little skin nick, and the instrument passes up through the abdomen. You pass the catheter that way. So I'm open to any questions, and uh, thank you for your attention, and this is my contact information.